class now. Oh, right, right, right. Suddenly, a Dalek walks into my classroom. So there's this hunter, and he wants to shoot a monkey for some reason. Welcome to this week's lesson. We're going to look at electrostatic potential. You might be familiar with this idea as maybe voltage from National 5, but we're going to improve upon that a little bit, delve a bit deeper into the basics of units, and then extend the idea to introduce a new description of potential that allows us to describe the potential around charges out in free space. The units for all of our science is based upon a system these days called the SI system, or System d'International. It's French for International System. And this is a good set because it is coherently defined. Every single unit is built up from the ground and there's no contradictions, there's no gaps, you don't need to do unnecessary amounts of converting, that sort of thing. It's really clean and efficient. It's really quite good. There have been several versions of it though, and as of 2019, it was changed yet again. So there's a little bit to talk about here. I don't want to go into everything. I won't talk about the moles, candelas, or the Kelvin scale, because it's not super relevant to this part of the course. And indeed, I've already in a previous video discussed the ampere a little bit. It used to be that the ampere was defined as a base unit, and then from that we derived the coulomb. Nowadays, it's actually the other way around. The charge of one electron is taken as a known value, and then we say one coulomb is a certain number of those. It's one divided by what you'll know as the charge on an electron. Notice how precisely that's known. And that work gives us a certain number. It turns out to be about 6 times 10 to the 24. That's how many electrons make one coulomb. And if you combine this with the definition of the second, which we'll talk about in a moment, you can then define the ampere, the unit for current, as being coulombs per second. So 6 times 10 to the 24 electrons flowing per second is the same thing as one ampere. And that's an ingredient for defining the volt, which we're going to come at today. But we need some other things, quite a few other steps actually. So it's a good time to talk about the other base units. In the SI system, there are seven fundamental starting points or base units that you have to find a way of agreeing upon and completely introducing. And it's very important these values are exactly measured as precisely as possible because everything else comes from that. In the past, when people used different units or had poorly defined units, one of the limiting factors when people discuss their ideas and try and check to see if they're on the same page, they might have gotten different results because they were using different units. And that's a very, very silly way to end up restricting the progress of science. If you have poor ideas or the experiments are very difficult to do, well, fair enough, that is a natural limit. But if you're holding yourself back just because you can't agree on the units, well, that's not very silly, uh, sensible at all. So I want to talk about how these things were originally defined and then gradually move towards the modern understanding. For seconds, for example, they used to be defined based on the length of the day. If you want to understand it, um, midday was always a traditionally important time. If you were in ancient times and you had to go hiking out into the woods to forage or to hunt, for example, then midday was the main sort of focus. You'd watch the sun getting higher and higher in the sky, and once it starts getting lower, that's your warning that you basically spent half of your time and you need to head back home. If it takes you six hours to walk away from camp, it'll likely take you six hours to walk back. Um, this actually culturally comes in with our lunchtime. It's usually around about midday because that was a big hit hangover from that point. So we can use this. Um, you can kind of define midday quite well, and you can measure it with a basic protractor. If you wanted to develop a definition of the second on that, you need something that changes over time. Could be a pendulum swinging, could be a grains of sand going through an hourglass, could be a pipe dripping water into a bucket, that kind of thing. But at midday on one day, let's say Monday, you start your tap flowing or your hourglass or whatever it might be, and then you just allow it to build up. You leave it running, you come back the next day, and at midday you stop whatever's been changing. And that will give you a certain measure. It could be in drops of water, grains of sand, swings of a pendulum, whatever but you have a certain number of a thing that happens once a day. That could be a basis of the unit for time. Whole days are quite big, so people, for whatever reason, chop them into 24 pieces to make the hour, and then the hours into 60 pieces to make minutes, and then minutes into 60 pieces to make seconds. We think 60 was chosen because it's quite a nice round number for dividing into fractions. You can divide it by halves, or quarters, or thirds, or fifths, or sixths, all quite nicely. But to be honest, the origin is a little bit of a mystery. So that Seems like a reasonable definition, why can't we just keep it simple like that? Well, it turns out you can if you want to be okay, but if you want to be really, really precise, then it's not going to work. For example, you can't really do this on a cloudy day, of course, but also measuring the precise moment that the sun's exactly at the top of its curve, well, that's really tricky. How do you know? When you look at the sun, you can't really see it moving, and looking at the sun is itself quite a difficult problem. So if you want to get it exactly right, you have to do something else. Um, one of the things that people did for a long time was the use of pendulums. So here I'm showing the second is used to define the meter, but before it was the other way around, you would have the pendulum built to a certain length, and the swing of a certain length of pendulum matches one second, and that would be one nice way of introducing it. This is much better than using the sun, because anyone can have a pendulum sitting in their cupboard, and that all works quite nicely. There were some limits, and you would have things like little g, which determines the swing of a pendulum. It varies slightly across the planet by about 1% or so. And if you 
had that, I'm sure you wouldn't mind if a second was 1% longer, but in terms of our scientific experiments, that would really, really be quite a hard limit that would cause lots of problems. So that's not nearly precise enough. We have to do much, much better. But pendulums would have been quite nice. And indeed, they were the basis of traditional clocks in church towers or in terms of um, grandfather clock later on in houses. And indeed, later on, they were used for measuring time out at sea, which allowed the modern world to get established because you basically need that in order to sail around the world. So pendulums have a special place in the history of physics, but they're not good enough for modern times. The modern version is to use an isotope of cesium, cesium-133. And if you have that at zero Kelvin, it will emit radiation at a certain rate. The energy levels naturally oscillate or vibrate inside the atoms, and it gives out radiation at a very, very consistent rate. So the modern definition is based upon one second being the time required for this very big number of decays, roughly 9 million million. Now, obviously, you can't go ahead and build one of those in your garage, but the advantage is this is a very, very, very precise value that is very, very consistent, and as far as we can tell, it's not ever going to change. It'll be the same now as it is a thousand years or even a million years from now, and it should be the same all around the universe. That's a very, very robust way to define your unit. The meter has a similar sort of history associated with it. Um, to begin with, it was just one big step. So a yard was one stride of an adult. Roughly speaking, it was three times the length of your feet. So if you wanted to roughly measure the size of a room, you can work it out in feet by literally just putting your feet heel to toe and walking around the room. And this is a good way of transferring a size from one place to another. That works out quite neatly. Obviously, if you're going to go and buy something, let's say I want to buy lengths of pipe, and if I want 10 feet of it, well, if I have large feet, I get more pipe compared to someone with smaller feet. And that's not a very useful, consistent system. And it would vary by person to person. So it's not very good between people, but within one person, it works out okay. Um, in more modern times, or getting closer to modern times, there was a French group that proposed a good idea for defining the meter better. They did it based upon the size of Earth. They said that from the North Pole to the equator would be the size they use. And you have to define it at a particular, a particular line on the globe. And, well, because they were French, they chose the line that goes through Paris. That was their particular measurement. And they were going to say that the new meter would be known as a certain fraction of that size. And the fraction would be set so that it matched the traditional rough size of one meter. That way no one has to change anything, but you have a better definition. Um, they tried that. They did quite a lot of work trying to exactly measure that size, but it turns out it's really quite tricky measuring from the North Pole down to the equator. Um, so it was an improvement in that it was a standard thing based on a physical measurement that everyone should agree on. But in practice, it was quite tricky. What they ended up using for quite some time was a reference artifact. Once people decided upon a size that was going to be known as a meter, they basically made a big stick that was exactly that size. And they tried to make it out of material, um, platinum, that wasn't going to chemically corrode, hoping that it would stay the same. And then in France, they had the world's meter stick, and every country would go along every so often and make a copy of it. And then they would use that copy to make more copies back in their country, and this was how everyone compared the size of one meter. Now, this allowed everyone around the whole globe to agree upon what exactly a meter should be. But it had a problem. You see, even if you're very, very careful, the size of that stick is still going to gradually change. If the temperature changes, it will expand, but also you can't completely stop chemistry. It was gradually either shrinking or growing, and then you've got the big problem that you're always having to make copies of copies. How do we know that that size of meter stick is the same today as it was maybe 100 years ago? How can we be sure that the scientific measurements we're using today are not going to be misunderstood 100 years from now if we go with that system? So it had to go. And what people came up with, which was quite nice, was based upon the speed of light. We know very, very carefully exactly how the speed of light is. In school, we call it 3 times 10 to the power of 8, but actually we know quite a few of these digits. And uh, the numbers shown up here on the screen. You can see that this is how many meters light travels per second. If you know meters and you know seconds, that allows you to measure this speed. But instead, we're now saying that the meter is defined by this fraction of how far light goes in a second. If you let light travel for one second and then divide that distance into this many pieces, that is what we're calling a meter. The beauty of this system is not only can we exactly measure it, it shouldn't change over time. It should be the same forever. And also, it wouldn't matter who you were speaking to. You could speak to any alien in the wide universe, if you manage that somehow, and you could communicate what you mean by one meter without having to go, uh, without having to have long conversations or having to exchange anything physically. So that's a big improvement. There was a similar story for the kilogram. Originally, it was defined based on the meter, and it still is, but it was defined as being based on one liter of volume. So 10 centimeters cubed is one liter. And if you fill that volume with water, uh, pure water at standard temperature and pressure, that was meant to have a mass of exactly one kilogram. And this is a fairly nice way of defining it. It allows conversions between different things quite nicely. It turns out though, defining anything based on a liquid is really quite tricky. You can't just have your kilogram one day because if you come back tomorrow, some of it will have evaporated. So liters were not the way to go. People then realize that if you have different temperature variations or different chemical compositions, all of these things might affect it. You could even think of it in terms of the isotopes. If you have water made from heavy hydrogen, it's going to be slightly heavier than if it was made with regular hydrogen. 
So instead of a liquid, people used a solid. They then came up with a platinum cube that had the same mass as exactly one liter of water. And then they tried to store that artifact and copy it all around the world. It was very, very recently that they actually updated that. That was the last unit to get redefined based upon a physical constant, because that one was really quite tricky. Um, how they've come up with that is they have a, a watt balance, which, is a, which was previously the way to measure um, the value of Planck's constant. Planck's constant used to be measured using this device. Um, and if you know kilograms and you know the other units, you can then work out what H is. But nowadays, we reverse that. We accept the value of H, and we say this device is therefore very good at matching the mass of a kilogram. So if you want to create your own artifact kilogram to compare to all other kilograms, you get one of these devices and you set all the various things to be the right values and that will very, very exactly produce one kilogram. Or at the very least, it'll tell you if your mass is too heavy or too light and you can add or subtract as needed to match that up. So those are the base units. <clears throat> um, how do we get to the volt? Well, the volt is what we call a derived unit. Similar to amperes, it comes from the others. And there's a bit of a chain here. So to work out the volt, we first need to figure out the newton. Now, Newton's from um, Newton's second law, F equals ma, can be defined quite nicely. One Newton is the force required to make one kilogram of material accelerate at a rate of one meter per second per second. So if you know what I mean by kilograms and meters and seconds, then I've just told you exactly what a Newton is. Once we have Newtons, we can then come up with a unit for energy. One of the fundamental equations of physics is that work done equals force times distance. So if you apply a certain force through a distance, that is you doing work. And this one's quite hard to visualize, but it is one of the fundamental ones at the basics of what we use. And if you apply a force of one Newton through one meter, that's going to cost you exactly what we're calling one joule of energy. How quickly you transfer energy or you exchange it or use it, you can consider it as, is defined as the watt. So one watt is when you're exchanging energy at a rate of one joule per second. And then last of all, using the equation you met for national five or power, we say that a volt is defined as being the potential difference required to make one amp of current use one watt of energy or to generate one watt of power. So if you have a wire and between two points you make one amp go somehow, it's going to cost you one joule per second to make that happen. That's when you've got one volt. Now it's worth pointing out that this equation here is equivalent to the familiar one, voltage equals joules per coulomb. You know how power relates to energy and we know how current relates to charge, so you could express this differently. It's just this is the one that's there for the formal definition. We can see a similar description on the Wikipedia page of the volt. There are actually many, many different ways to derive this unit. So it's still based upon the fundamental standards, but how you choose to express it, either as watts per amp or joules per coulomb or webers per second or amp ohms, that's kind of up to you when you're doing the application. It's named after this gentleman. This is Alexander Volta, and he lived a very long time ago in Italy. He's famous for inventing the electric cell. Here's a picture of his original model, and here's a diagram. It's basically a battery. And his work was absolutely spectacular at the time because he was the one that allowed people to start properly studying this and to start harnessing it. You can actually have electricity power something or do something useful. Before that, um, he lived at a time when people really didn't understand what was going on. On the one hand, people were aware of things like lightning. Lightning in those days was a bit like a volcano. It's absolutely terrifying. It would cause fires to spread across your city and the whole town could burn down because you didn't have the availability of enough water to put out, that sort of thing. So lightning was considered as being a primal or supernatural force that you should really be careful not to offend your various deities because if you do, they might use lightning or generate lightning to destroy your town or village. Scary times indeed. And the other types of work that was going on at the time is there's a group of people known as electricians. These days that means someone who wires up your house, but in those days they were performers. They were people who understood how to generate electrostatic charges and they combined that with a heck of a lot of showmanship and a bit of mysticism to create spooky, surprising entertainment experiences that they would deliver in people's houses. They would make things levitate or glow or send sparks out of their fingers or shock people, that kind of thing. And the reason they got so much money for being so entertaining wasn't so much the physics. It was that at the time, as far as most people were concerned, these things were fully supernatural. The only way you can make these things happen is if you were either an angel or you were channeling the devil or that sort of thing. It was riveting entertainment. If I thought I could find a magician who could genuinely do magic, I would certainly spend an evening being entertained by that person. So that was the two halves of it, really. And people were starting to try and experiment. The people, mainly around Europe and in American things, they were finding ways of building up large electrostatic charges and making the electricity jump. They were trying to figure out what this phenomenon was. But they could never store it. It was really annoying for them. They kind of had this idea that it was a fluid. And if you have a bucket of water, you can pour it through a pipe, and that works nicely. But they could only ever get it moving. They couldn't sort of store it from day to day. And because of that, they couldn't actually do any good experiments with it. It became really quite tricky to compare because you don't see anything, don't see anything, don't see anything, zap, and that's it. So people had all sorts of problems. 
And what they would need to do is wind something up. They would turn a big crank eventually, which would allow them to very quickly build up very high potentials and get very powerful effects. But sometimes it could kill them. It's very scary. But Volta's work with his um, cells, based on pairs of metals, allowed him to have a steady flow of electricity. This was something you could build, put in a box, and you can have it set up, use it any day you want. And it was reasonably consistent from day to day. With enough of them, you could even power things. But I'm not sure if you ever did. This was mainly a scientific interest at the time. Um, this equation here is the one I think is most helpful for thinking about it. The voltage is energy per charge. And he was involved in both works for measuring charge and for working out ways to measure voltage. The energy measurements came from other things that were separate from the whole idea. At the time, um, Volta's big competition, or main sort of opposition, I suppose, was someone called Gilvani. And Gilvani was not a physicist, he was a medical person. He was a doctor or a surgeon, and he was employed at a university giving lectures on anatomy. So how the different parts of the human body go together. And at the time, they didn't have a system where you could dissect living people. Um, there was a big shortage in human bodies to be used for that type of experimentation. It was considered completely obscene or you know underhanded, and people might be you know, trying to do satanic type ideas, and people were very, very nervous about that. So doctors couldn't experiment with um, dead bodies, which means you either don't learn, or ultimately you're kind of experimenting on living people just by practicing, which obviously isn't a very good system. So what they often used were animals, and Volta, or Calvani, was famous for a demonstration he did with a frog leg. He discovered one day when he was doing a dissection that he touched something, and then the whole muscle of the frog leg suddenly contracted. In our modern understanding, we can explain this. Um, there is a nerve running through the frog leg, and the whole muscle is very, very strong in a frog, and it's freshly dead. The muscle cells are still alive. So if you apply a voltage to the nerve tissue, electricity will travel through the nerve, and then the muscles will receive that signal, and they will contract just as though it was living. But at the time, no one understood this. They thought that they were, you know, how they were holding it, or there was something within the tissue itself that they were using that was then suddenly creating this effect. Galvani described this as animal electricity, and he considered it completely separate from any of the physical type arrangements. This was kind of thought to be almost the fluid that life runs on. This is what makes life separate from other inanimate objects. This is what makes us all special. Maybe when people have a stroke, for example, or a heart attack, maybe the problem is they've run out of this electrical fluid. So if you can understand what it is, maybe you can treat people. That was the idea. But Volta, he said, no, no, that's not what's happening. What's happening is you're using one metal to pin the bottom of the frog, and you're touching the top of the nerve with a separate metal. Maybe this fact, uh, the scalpel is made out of steel and the pins are made out of copper. That kind of idea. Because, sure enough, when you do the frog experiment with the same metals, you don't get the effect. And Volta was able to take this idea, and he identified that some metals are able to release electrons to other metals. In our modern time, we say there's an electrochemical series, where different metals like to hold on to them by different amounts, basically. And if you stack a whole bunch of them together, well, to begin with, nothing happens until you connect the two sort of ends together somehow. Then the electricity flows in the whole system, which results in an overall transfer from one metal to another. So well, that's a bit of history. Hopefully the context is helpful to you. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the idea of potential, not in a regular or a general electric field, but in a special kind, in a uniform electric field. You'll know from um, previously, hopefully, that if you have a pair of parallel plates, the space in between them will have a very even and useful for studying type of electric field. This is called a uniform electric field. And what that means is in there, the field lines are all exactly parallel. There is a bit of an edge effect, but you just avoid going near the edges, and then you can study it quite nicely. Now, it turns out this type of system makes it easier for me to explain to you what's going on. But a similar thing works for other ones, and it allows us to introduce a new equation. And what we're going to say is that if I've made this, if I transferred some of the electrons from plate A over to plate B somehow, maybe I've, I've rubbed them, or I don't know, how, somehow I've moved them over. Well, if I then say I want to move a positive charge, now again, Technically, positive charges are always stuck to the parent atoms, and they're not physically moving around, but that's just how people have chosen to define this. So I'm going to say, I want to move a positive charge away from the negative plate, and drag it all the way through this field, and put it down on the positive plate here over at A. And the thing is, this is going to cost me energy. That little positive charge, it likes me next to the negative charges, and it really doesn't like me next to its fellow positives, so it's going to be unhappy about this. We say the field exerts a force on the positive charge, pushing it to the right, but I'm going to go and drag it to the left. And there are some dimensions here, my plates are a certain distance apart, and there is a certain electrostatic potential difference across them. These are the two things that affect how much energy I'm going to have to use. So, work must be done, that means it's going to cost me energy to move this charge on over. And you might say, well, how are we going to work out what that means, or how much that's going to be? Well, as our starting point, work is defined as being the change in electrostatic potential energy. What is the change in energy always? And based on our previous definition of voltage being energy per charge, we can say here that energy is therefore the charge times the change in the potential. That's Q delta V. 
I'm then going to change the left hand side of this equation. I'm going to say that in general, always work done is force times distance. Now, technically, if you're moving at an angle to the field, it would be force times distance times cosine theta. But here, because we're going along the lines, it's just force times distance because theta of zero would make cosine theta equal to one. Now, this little step here only works if you have a constant uniform field. So here, the force to go a little bit there is the same as it is at the end, as it is at the middle. The force throughout this whole region is consistent, and that simplifies the maths a little bit. So that's my step here. And then I'm going to replace delta v, although we could stick with delta v if you really wanted to. It's just the equation list gives it to you as v. And I'm going to say that's defined as the potential difference between plate A and plate B. That's here. So I swap that out. Next, I want to simplify a little bit. I'm not trying to link potential to force. I want to link it to the electric field. So I'm going to divide both sides by the charge. That's a little q. And then I'm going to move the d over to the right-hand side. And now I have the expression force over charge equals potential per unit of distance. Finally, I know what force over charge is. That's defined as being the electric field. That's what we mean by the word electric field. So electric field is force per charge, so I can swap that out here. And that gets us to our equation. The electric field is defined as volts per meter. Or you can think of this as defining the potential as well, I suppose, as being the electric field multiplied by the distance. You can say the potential means how much energy it's going to take you to move this thing through the whole distance, or the electric field is kind of the gradient of the potential in space how many volts you're going to change per meter as you move through space. So that's the sort of two conclusions that come from this, and we're going to talk about each of these in turn. Um, first, we're going to have a look at this in a slightly more generalized way, though. More generally, we need to find a way to define the electrostatic potential of any given point in space without assuming the electric field is uniform. And this is a little bit trickier, and it does require um, some calculus. So. If you were happy to talk about potential difference, the technical name for voltage, then any two points will have a difference in their potential. But here I want to just talk about potential as something the entire universe agrees upon. This little point here has a certain potential. So when I'm going to compare it to something, I need to compare it to something that's going to be consistent. And there's a little trick. We actually compare it to infinity, which might sound a bit strange. So we say that we have our charges and we're going to start or use our reference point as being infinitely far away from that charge or indeed any other charge. Infinity away is very, very far away. We're saying that that point has a potential of exactly zero. And then as we bring our positive charge closer and closer and closer to this starting big positive charge, that's going to cost us energy. It's going to be harder and harder to get it here. Now, as you should know from Coulomb's law, or indeed the electric field lesson, as we bring our charge in closer and closer and closer, the force of repulsion is going to get bigger. You can say the electric field is stronger. Now, because this value changes over space, when we add up all the little bits of force we've had to overcome, when we're doing our work done equals force times distance, we have to do this piece by piece. So to define some terms, I'm going to say I'm going to start at infinity, and then I'm going to end my journey at a certain point p. Point P is a distance R from the starting charge, and the current position I'm at, somewhere in between, is going to be defined as X. And then there's a certain force between my big charge and my little test charge at this point, and I'm going to move it a tiny little distance along. I'm going to move it DX. So when I'm at this position, I know the size of the force, and I can multiply that by a tiny little distance, and that works out how much energy it costs me to move from here to the next bit. I'm then going to do that over and over and over again, working out the force every single time and adding them all up. Or rather, that's the equivalent to what I could do. In practice, that's a real pain in the neck to compute, so instead we're going to use integration, but that's the idea. That's what we're saying here. So how does that work? Well, I'm going to say that the change in energy, or the change in work, is equal to the force multiplied by the change in distance. In other words, work equals force times distance, but a tiny bit of distance, which results in a tiny change in the energy. Because we are talking about things in reverse, if you like, I'm going to say that the force is equal to minus the electrostatic repulsion. That's just based on us starting with zero being the starting position and us getting higher and higher and higher. And then I want to add up all this across the whole range of x, which means I integrate both sides. So I add my integral, and it's a definite integral from infinity to a particular location, it has limits. And then on this right hand side, I'm going to first swap out the value for f. I know Coulomb's law, it's all this stuff here. And I'm going to integrate across, again, same range, infinity up to r for all these little x's. That's what I need to work out. I can then do a bit of simplification. 
the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is just a number, and when you integrate a number, you just get that number out, it doesn't change. And I don't want to have the total energy, what I want to work out is the potential. So I'm going to do V equals energy per charge, so I'm going to divide both sides by my, the size of my test charge, so this charge comes over to here, and then E over Q is equal to V, and that doesn't change, that's just specific at that point. And then that leaves me with just a single Q here, so I'm going to drop the subscript. This charge, whatever it is, that's the charge that set up the potential at that point. It's a number. It doesn't depend upon the value of x. In my diagram here, this charge stays the same regardless of what we're talking about. So it's not going to change. It also comes out with the integral. And then we have this term to evaluate. To help you see what comes next, I'm going to say that x squared, or 1 over x squared, is equal to x to the power of minus 2. And then we apply the rule. And the rule is we increase the power by 1, that takes it to minus 1, and then we divide by the new power. So x divided by minus 1 is just minus x. And then for simplicity, I'm going to convert back into the 1 over form, and then that changes that to this, and the two negatives are going to cancel each other out. So I have the voltage will be equal to this constant term, and then it's going to depend upon x at these two positions. Applying the limits, well the first one is at r, and the second one is when x is equal to infinity. So that's this term here. Now I think at this point the mathematicians would get a little bit upset and say, well you can't really divide by infinity. Well that's probably true, but if you particularly wanted to, to choose a number, you can pick any number you want, and you can make it as big as you like, and if you just choose the biggest number you can be bothered writing down, one divided by that number will be so close to zero that it can be considered zero. It's not going to affect the result. So this taking away zero term just disappears. And then we combine this r back into here, or rather with the q in this format, and that gives us this value. This is saying the electrostatic potential measured in volts, which is the same as joules per coulomb, is equal to the same constant as before, and now it depends upon the charge and the distance. Notice this distance, this separation, is not squared. The previous equations had r squared. This makes it slightly different. So we need some examples to help us understand exactly what's going on. The first one here is fairly straightforward. It says calculate the electrostatic potential at this distance away from this size of charge. So you do exactly what you would expect. You take the equation, you put the various numbers in, and then you work out the sum. Again, please note this shortcut isn't exactly considered proper. You risk losing the substitution mark if you make a mistake anywhere here. You should really work out exactly the value of epsilon naught and substitute that in. Why might people find this difficult? Well, the main issue, I believe, is that you so far have three equations, and there's a fourth, that has this 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught term. Is it the 1 with two q's, or is it r, or is it r squared? People get very confused. So it's very important that you separate these ideas in your head. In the second example, we're told there's a point um, next to two charges. One of them has a charge of 4.8 nanocoulombs, so that's positive here, and the other is minus 9.6 nanocoulombs. These are separated by 15 centimeters. We're asked to find the position where the potential is zero. Now that might confuse you because you say, well, if only infinity had zero. Well, no, not really. I said infinity is defined as having zero potential, but that doesn't mean it's the only place. Here, bringing another little positive charge in next to this guy, well, that costs you energy. But bringing it next to a negative charge, that gains you energy. So the two of these will actually be able to oppose each other and they'll be able to cancel that effect out. It just depends on how close you are to one or the other. And then to draw my diagram, I thought, well, which one am I going to be closest to? Am I going to be closest to the big charge or closest to the small charge? And obviously here, if they have to be the same size and this one's bigger, well, I need to be closer to the small one. That way, it has a chance to compete. And the next thing is, well, my equation from before, it expresses everything in terms of the distance. So I could say this value here is r, that's how far away p is from this first charge. And then this other distance here, I could define as r2 or some other letter. But that's not actually going to help, because I'm going to end up having to solve two equations with two unknowns, and that's not going to be any use. So I've kind of skipped a step here and said all of this distance is 15 centimeters, and this is r. So this bit here is the total of 15, take away whatever that bit is. I'm building this into the working. This is similar to one of the previous examples in a different video. Now I'm going to also avoid taking this equation and calculating them separately and having to merge them. I'm going to formulate my problem slightly differently. I'm going to say at a certain position of P, the first potential by this one is the same as this potential over here. Or indeed a common way of writing that is V1 take away V2 is equal to zero. I can then use the potential equation to substitute for V1, 
and also substitute for v2. Notice the separation here is the full 0 0.15 minus r. And then I have two terms, each with charges I haven't substituted in yet, but they just have one unknown, the value of r. To make life a bit easier, I can multiply through all three terms by the constant, the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So that kind of just disappears, and then substituting in the 4.8 and the 9.6 for the charges leads to this. Again, I've cancelled out the nano term, the times 10 to the minus 9, just to make life a bit simpler. To get the next stage, well, if I take this term, add it to both sides, it appears over there, and then I'm going to take the denominator, multiply it up, and this r, multiply it over there, and that leads to this line here. It's essentially just algebra. Once I'm here, I'm, I divided both sides by 4.8, 9.6 over 4.8 is 2, and that just leaves this bracket. Add the r to both sides, I get 3r over here, and finally, radius is 0 0.05 meters. And I should properly define that as being 50 millimeters from Q, charge Q1 towards charge Q2. Um, this example is more complicated. We're told that there are small spheres of 4 nanocoulombs, minus 4, and plus 6, as well as 12 nanocoulombs, all placed in a square configuration with diagonal distances of 0 0.4 meters. You could have got something as complex as this for any of the previous two lessons, but to be entirely honest, this is pushing the boat out quite a bit. You're unlikely to be asked to do this level of demand in an exam. But as a learning exercise, it'll serve our purposes quite nicely. So what we're asked to find is the potential at point A, which is exactly in the center. And you might say, well, how am I going to do that? Well, it's the same trick as before. We work out the potential for each one separately, and we add them all together. We don't have a symmetry here, though. Or at least we don't have a complete symmetry. Um, so this negative one will make the potential higher, this positive will make it lower, and these two effects will cancel each other out. But down here at the bottom, we have two positive charges, which are both going to add to it. And you can see that part B actually asks us for about a slightly more complicated value. Now to do this, I have chosen to break the usual rule about substituting first, and I've just said V is equal to this number here, or this equation, and then I've substituted four times for each of the other parts of the problem. And you just work through the numbers. The distance here is, for the whole diagonal, was 0 0.4 meters, so each distance is the same, it's 0 0.2 meters. And you work out all four of the values, keeping track of the sign, the one with the negative charge makes the potential negative, that means you're gaining energy by putting it there, and you can sum them all up together. And it turns out you get 810 volts. Notice here, this is one of the trap equations, uh, questions, sorry. <clears throat> if you don't use the 9 to times 10 to the power of 9 shortcut, you actually get a final answer of 809. This is slightly different. You might think that's basically the same, but actually no. Technically, your final answer would be incorrect, and because you haven't substituted here or shown substitution, you've lost that as well. And the only thing I'd get for this whole problem would be a single mark for knowing the equation. Not worth the risk. Um, so to figure out the total potential in point A is actually quite easy. Point B is much, much harder. But it doesn't look that much harder. This is something to be wary of. You can have questions that look very, very similar, and some are significantly more complex than others. It's not any more difficult because of the new equation, though. That step happens just down here. The reason it's more complicated is you have to work out the distance to B for all four of these charges. This is essentially a National 5 math problem, or rather four National 5 math problems, in addition to a bit of physics. So to work out these distances, I'm going to define this distance from A to B as distance AB. And this distance from charge 2 to B is going to be equal to D to B. And I know it's a right angle because this was a square. Because it's a square and this is the center, I know these two sides are actually the same. So Pythagoras says this value squared equals that one squared plus that one squared, or two of them. So I can work this all out, and the size of D2B, that's this distance here, is 0 0.141. That's how far down we're going to go for charge number two. Charge number four is the same, and it's also part of what we need for the other two. For the other sizes, um, distance 3 to B, that's this one here, or it's the same as this one, I need to take the value from before and also know the value along here, which is twice this value. It's two halves of the square, as it were. I can compute that using Pythagoras again, and I get a hypotenuse length of 0 0.313 meters. Again, this is National 5 Maths, albeit in a complicated context, with lots of extra steps where errors can be introduced, but I don't think I'm telling you anything revelatory here. <laughs> 
Once we know all of our distances, keeping track of which charges go where and the signs, we can work out the potential from all four of them at this position. We add them all up and we end up with a number of 588. That's the potential at that point. But I didn't read it, but the question says, calculate the potential difference between A and B. So to work out the potential difference, we need the potential at A, we had that, and the potential at B, we just got that. Now we need to take the difference, which turns out to be 221 volts. This is a very, very demanding question. Don't expect it to be considered normal, but each step in this process should be understandable by you if you take your time to go through it. The second type of question you might be asked is a drawing based on. So I showed you simulations before with the electric field lesson. Here are some snapshots that associate with that. Before we said there are electric field lines around charges. For example, in this positive charge, it is radially showing that the electric field points away. That's also the direction of the force on a positive test charge that you place there. Likewise, for the negative one, it's the same pattern, but the force lines point in the way. Um, I should also note that the density of these field lines indicate the strength of the field, and you can also identify points where there is no electric field by comparing them here. So this point there, for example, is where the electric field will be zero. This point over here, it's not zero because both the fields work together and it's actually very, very strong there. But I now want to introduce another thing called equipotentials. That's shown in green lines in these diagrams. Now, equipotentials, they show places where the potential is equal. That's what the word means. So everywhere along this green line has the same potential. That's because you're the same distance from the charge causing that potential. And if you're closer, well, it's still going to be equal all around the circle, but it's going to be equal to a bigger number. And one nice way to visualize this to make it easier to understand is to think in terms not of charges, but of gravitational equivalents. We could say this is like a potential hill, and these are contours on the map. And if you simulate that in 3D, it might look something like this from the side. So the higher you are up on this hill, the more potential you have. And the steeper the side of the slope, well, that tells you how strong the electric field is or how big the force is. Remember I said before that the gradient of the potential gives you the electric field. Now, shown in isolation, it's a nice model and it works nicely for the negative ones as well. Here we say it's a potential well. You can imagine placing a little positive charge, kind of like a marble or something near here, and the, the curve of the material naturally causes you to fall in and you even spiral down into it, which is exactly what happens with moving charges. We say a positive charge placed here will fall into this potential well, or it might get pushed off of this one. So that works out quite nicely. How deep you are in this well corresponds to how much energy you've gained going in, and likewise, that's how much energy it's going to take to pull you back out. The flat would correspond to being out at infinity. One of the things that's quite useful is if you consider the combination case where you have a pair of charges next to each other, it can be quite tricky to figure out what's going on in these diagrams. You see here there's this green line. This potential here is not just an equipotential, that's actually the zero equipotential. Here you're just as far from the positive charge as the negative charge, which are equal in size, and that means their effect is cancelling out in terms of the potential. So it costs you a certain amount of energy to drag a positive charge to here because of the red one, but you gain some energy dragging it in because of the blue one. So you can actually freely move up along this line without spending any energy. That's quite interesting to note. In terms of our 3D diagram, that's sort of the flat line that's between these two curves. If you're a positive charge and you're placed up here, you're going to roll down the hill, and then you're going to roll down this hill again. So the electric field is definitely pushing you from the high level down to the low level. That's relatively easy to understand. But right at this middle, before you've fallen from the high level to the low level, you're back to zero. You're back at the natural starting point out at infinity. And you can imagine walking along this green line here as being the same as walking along there. You're not gaining or losing any energy to do it, but of course, as soon as you get close to this slope, you're then going to fall down. Again, the electric field is the gradient of the potential of the area. In the case of a pair of light charges, they actually have an interesting effect in the middle. So here, the two of them are both going to cost you energy to get there. When you drag a uh, positive charge in from infinity, it's going to cost you more and more energy. Both of them are opposing you. Both of them are going to cost you. And if you go and stand exactly in the middle, well, you might think I'm equally distant from both. Well, you are. They're both going to push you away. But the one on the right says go left, and the one on the left says go right. They both fight with each other. There is no electric field there. But if you're slightly above, as I said last time, they're both going to push you up, and you're going to fall away. The equipotentials 
looks something weird like this. You have these um, circles just like individually as before, although it's slightly different, but once you move out to a certain distance, all well, the potential is actually the same and you get one overall circle. There's a conceptual idea here that close to this charge is just like it's the only charge in the world. Close to that charge, it's like it's the only charge in the world. And really, really far away, well, these two charges might as well be one extra big charge together because you can't even tell that you don't just have regular circles. Um, as I said, you can imagine on this map here, you could in principle sit exactly on this level because it should be sort of balanced there, but it's kind of like walking along a mountain ridge. If you take one step to the bottom or the top here, you're going to tumble on down and shoot off out to infinity. We can now start to describe how the potential and the electric field propagate through space. We can understand how they work. They're kind of equivalent. If you understand one of them, or if you know one of them about distribution of charges, you kind of automatically know the other. The two of them are fundamentally linked. They're not separate things. But the electric field is all about force per coulomb. That's the push on your charge. And the electrostatic potential, well, that's the energy per coulomb. That's how much it costs to get you there in the first place. And I want to consider a conducting hollow sphere, which has a certain charge on it. So we have this charged up sphere. And this is the sort of thing you might expect in a test or an exam problem. It could just be, draw a sketch of the electric field around this object. So the, the natural starting point would be the center of it. And if you take a 1D slice through the space with this object right in the center, you can just define the entire area in terms of the distance away. Because all around it in different directions is going to be symmetric. So in the exact center, we place the R axis. And the axis here has the electric field strength. Now from the equation, we can predict what's going to go on. Even if you hadn't been told a thing about it, just looking at this equation tells you everything you need to know outside of this object. So the charge will give you a certain maximum size, and if you start off at a certain distance, that's your starting point. That's the maximum. And then if you move further and further away, the value is going to get lower and lower and lower. It's going to decay proportional to radius squared. It's an inverse square law. So it will decay quite steeply. It will shoot on down. And eventually it'll get to zero, but that'll take infinitely far away, so we don't draw it actually being zero. I'm defining here the radius as being A, so between negative A and positive A, that's basically corresponding to being inside this thing. We also have to remember that on the inside, by definition almost, there is no electric field. If there was an electric field on a little charge that's making up this big charge, it would then cause the charges to move around. So you're never going to get an electric field on the inside. So it basically shoots down to zero. If you wanted to be specific and add numbers to this graph, which is always a good idea, um, there's a rule of thumb, by the way. If the question gives you numbers, you have to give numbers back. Here, we haven't given you numbers, so you don't have to give a number back. But we could express the value of this size. If I knew the number for A, the radius, and I knew the charge on it, I can actually work out what this peak value is right at the surface of the sphere. For the potential, it's a similar-ish story. It will also decay from a maximum on the surface and get lower and lower and lower. But it will actually follow not an inverse square law, but just a regular inverse law. So its rate of curvature won't be quite as steep. But it will be zero off at infinity. That's again almost by definition of potential. It's always going to be zero at either positive infinity or negative infinity. Um, at the surface, we're going to have a maximum value again based on the size of the charge and the radius of the sphere. We could work that out if we had those numbers. And then inside the material, we're going to have a consistent potential. It costs a certain amount of energy to drag a positive charge in here. But once we've landed, you can actually move that thing around however you want because there's no electric field in there stopping you. It doesn't require a force to move around inside there because there's no preference, if you like, with regard to the electric field. Um, if you imagine the alternative, if you could gain or lose energy by moving around inside there, then that would cause charges to move. So therefore, it can't be happening. This equation isn't actually given in your equation list, but it's almost a true by definition type thing. There's a fourth one that I like to introduce called the electrostatic potential energy. So rather than working out the potential, which is energy per coulomb, here we multiply our potential by the charge of a particular charge. So if I ask you how much energy will it take to drag one plus coulomb of charge to a particular point, well then the equation for V does that for you. But what happens if I bring in a different charge, either smaller or bigger? What happens if my charge has 10 coulombs, for example? So I know the cost, if you like, the energy per coulomb is this equation, 
If I multiply that by the number of coulombs I'm bringing, charge number one, then that will work out the total energy. And this is equivalent to EP's MGH in the gravitational system. Here's a straightforward, simple example just to illustrate the fact. The final thing worth discussing is an alternate unit. So I know we like standard units, but sometimes in some contexts, alternative derived units are quite useful. So we've said that the energy can be related to potential. So potential is energy per coulomb. Right, fine. But if you're dealing with very, very small scales, it's often a lot easier not to talk about coulombs at all. So rather than talking about the energy required for 6 times 10 to the 24 electrons, why don't you just talk about the energy per electron? And that's actually one way of dealing with things. So we could make an alternative version of voltage, but we don't. Instead, we make an alternative voltage for energy. And this is commonly quoted when we're talking about the energy levels in an atom. One electron volt is the energy required to move one electron through a potential difference of one volt. That's how that works. It's really just a rearrangement. And its size is the same as the charge on an electron, but expressed in joules. That's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening.